I thought about hiding behind the screen and preaching back there. I think that would be fun. I don't know if I can preach with you sitting there all zombified up, Trevor. Well, still, you've got like a dozen socks. Um, how do you guys feel about decisions? You can't even decide how you feel about decisions. <laughs> um, are any of you like excellent at decision making, no problem, something comes up, you have choice A, B, or C, and you're like, done. Katie is a decision. So if you have problems deciding, contact Katie. You want to give your email out? Just kidding. By the hour. But you're a quick decision maker, so that's cool. I also, the, the website said we had a guest speaker tonight. Uh, I thought I would trick you all, but apparently a lot of people found out I was speaking um, because there's some empty chairs. <laughs> We're in Romans chapter 6. Uh, if you've got you version, pull it up. Nicholas uh, is at a concert with his brother, and so I did it myself, so if it's messed up, that's why. Romans chapter 6, uh, Nathaniel did the first half of this last week. This week we're going to go through 15 through 23. So if you want to follow along there, or I got fancy for you. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you, are pre if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification." For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul uses his death in the first half of this chapter that Nathaniel spoke about last week. If you missed it, you can go online and listen to it. Uh, but he uses death as his illustration there in the first part. And this week, he's using slavery primarily as his illustration. This is important to us. It's important to the way that we live our life, uh, that he said it twice. It's so important that Paul says it two different ways, hoping that because of our natural limitations, he says here, it will sink in. Uh, we're all, apparently, other than Katie, bad decision makers. And so Paul wants to help us along in that process. Uh, and so I want to kind of go through this section of the chapter a little bit, kind of piece by piece, because uh, if you guys are like me at all, and I found out when I was studying through this that you read through it, and you have no idea what you just read, and then you see a word like sanctification, and sometimes you actually read the whole word, and sometimes you're reading it like, and da 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 and you skip right over some things. So I want to break that down and then kind of see what, what this has to do with us today. Because Paul wrote this a long time ago to people in Rome. And we are not people in Rome. So in verse 16, you are slaves of the one you obey. Sin has the ability to trap you. It just kind of creeps into your life. And sin is, is anything that's contrary to God. And our goal is to live like Jesus. So if we're living like Jesus, who is God in the flesh, and sin is contrary to God, then that doesn't work. You can't do both. Sin causes us to miss that goal. Maybe, maybe the first time that you did something, it, it felt weird. Uh, maybe the first time that you, you, know, you slipped in the bank, you pulled up your ski mask, and you robbed them. It was a little uncomfortable, all right? You couldn't quite breathe right with the mask. You know how sometimes like the, when, you, when you talk with a ski mask, when you're telling them to, to give you all the bills and not do the ink packs and all that stuff? Because we all watch police shows on TV. We know how it works. 
it was just awkward. But the second time, you know, you, you cut a little slit in the mouth, and so you did that better. You remembered to take the little orange piece off of the toy gun so it wasn't as obvious that it wasn't a real. You learn, and you do better. And each time you go back to that bank, you know, you, you're better at that sin. You're better at that thing you do. You get to know the tellers by name. They know who you are. <laughs> by this time, they have your account number memorized. But it, it gets easier and easier each time you sin. Are you a slave to robbing banks? Probably not. I won't definitively say no. Maybe, maybe you're a slave to pride. I mean, you guys, most of us in the room, I say us so I feel good, are students at Missouri University of Science and Technology. I mean, this place is rated somewhere on a list really high up. So that's a good thing, right? It's something to be proud of. Maybe, maybe you're envious of someone else because of what they have or because of what they look like. Maybe you're a slave to a relationship. Maybe you and that special someone spent a little too much time together, got a little too comfortable, each time a little more comfortable. You crossed some lines. You get bored or distracted with life. It's easy to slip into that and let sin creep into your life. It's easy to let sin take you places you shouldn't be. It's easy to let sin take control, let it own you. It causes you to feel a loyalty to it. You become a slave to your sin. It becomes your identity. You feel like you have to do this thing. You have no choice. It's not your decision to do this. You are slaves to the one whom you obey. No more. I want you to see this, to know this in that next couple verses there, to understand and live like this. It says, you were once slaves of sin and have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. No more does sin, no more does Satan own you. You chose God. And he stepped up and paid the price. And now, like that second verse I read says, having been set free, do you realize what this means? How many times, if you think back honestly at your life, have you found yourself repetitively in a bad cycle? You have so much worth. God did this for you, and you are free. From whatever you thought had you, Whatever you thought owned you, no more. You were slaves, and you have already been set free. It is done. You once presented yourself, verse 19, presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness. Later in that verse, it says, now you present your members as slaves to righteousness. Once you did impurity and, unlawless, and lawlessness, now you have righteousness. We forget that. We forget that we have righteousness. Whatever you once obeyed, whatever you previously did, whatever you thought, whatever you experienced, whatever you have seen, wherever you have been, no more. We used to obey impurity and lawlessness, but now I know that I can be obedient to righteousness. Now, now in verse 22, it says that you have been set free from sin. I can't stress this enough. Not you will be set free from sin. Not you're on the list. I'll see if I can get to you. You have been set free from sin. So produce fruit through Christ to sanctification. And there's the word again. And I thought I would define it because I know sanctification. Of course I know what that means. So I looked it up to be able to explain it to you better. It's one of those you can use in context. I had a guy in college, super smart guy, probably like you guys, sort of. Big words was all he used. Big words were all he used, and he used good grammar as well. Um, But he would read a lot, and he could use big words in context, but he didn't know what they meant. And I I am not that intelligent, 
But I picked up on this. I mean, I'm, I'm okay compared to some people. <laughs> but I picked up on this, and one day I asked him, and, and I think Shandy may know Chris Cheney. Um, yeah, she knows him. So this makes a better mental image for her, and he's an awesome guy. He actually worked ahead and got a semester ahead in college. I don't know. <laughs> I watched The Matrix with him once to get him to shut up, and we were up to like 3 in the morning talking about Christology in The Matrix. Never invited him into my room again. <laughs> but he would use these big words, and one time I called him out, not in public at all, because that's just a terrible thing to do, but I called him, I was like, Chris, do you even know what that word means? He's like, no. <laughs> Sanctification means to make holy. So produce fruit. Do things. Show people that you are saved, that you are free from sin through Christ to make them holy, to make yourself holy. That fruit that you produce shows your holiness in God. It is your choice. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. How many of you are, at least in part, at this school because at some point in the future, there will be wages? Okay? Okay, there you go. Wages are good, okay? Um, the, it's important. You work, and you expect to be compensated accordingly. So you get a degree from Missouri University of Science and Technology, and you have all these clubs and design teams and organizations, and of course, any employer is going to be impressed that you are part of CCF, and they're going to pay you. What's the, what's the ranking we have, universities? Like It's like one of the top five, the third, top three, whatever, uh, in, in awesome salaries to go forward. Keep that in mind. Keep in mind how much you love your staff here at CCF. <laughs> <laughs> the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. I think I'd rather go with eternal life. This passage is hard. Um, it, it's not an easy passage. I This week, last week, the past few weeks when I was looking over this trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, I really, really regretted when the decision was made to go through Romans this year. Uh, this is some tough stuff, but it's also super easy because it says things so plainly. We are not slaves to our sin. We do not have to obey our evil desires. We don't have to do bad things. We don't have to think in ways that we ought not think. Sin is a problem, but it isn't the problem. I mentioned a few weeks ago we put the creature above the creator. Our problem is a decision-making problem. We already know we're bad decision-makers. That's our problem. We make bad choices. We have a problem making good choices. You have been set free from sin. So why would you go back? Why would you return to slavery after you've been freed? There's a story in the Bible in Luke chapter 15. I'm going to read a little bit to you. And these are in red letters, so that means Jesus said it, so it's as important as everything else in the Bible, maybe more. 15, 4 through 7. What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need repentance. God has rescued you. God has freed you from slavery. What now? You're the lost sheep. God came and he found you. For the most part, we don't really understand this illustration of slavery. I think a lot of us don't fully grasp what that means. I mean, the United States has this, this past of slavery, and we learned a little bit about it. Some people say what we learned in school was accurate. Others say it wasn't accurate, but we know it was a thing. We can look in ancient world history, and there were slaves. And then we look at today, and it's easy to think that that's not a thing. But I, I hope all of you know by this point in your life, with as many different social media outlets there are, that slavery is a thing that goes on now. It's a little bit offensive to me to think about. And I, I've talked to my small group, I've talked to a couple people this week about slavery and some of those situations, and I, I, can't, I can't get my mind around that. Why one person thinks they're able to own someone else. 
they're able to treat someone else the way that some of these men, women, boys, and girls are treated. There are an estimated 45 million men, women, boys, and girls trapped in slavery. We've done some awareness events in the past. Some of you have been around for a few of them. Um, We're planning one for this spring. Slavery is a real thing. These kids don't get to choose. Some of them, their parents sell them into slavery because they have nothing. Some of these kids are just flat out taken. They're grabbed. They're snatched. And they're forced to do horrible things. I can't get my mind around it. It doesn't make sense. The um, co-founder of Rafa House, which primarily rescues young women from sexual slavery, um, she was in town this past weekend and spoke at Green Tree. Was it this past weekend? Yeah. Time. Um, this past weekend, she spoke there. And, and one of the stories she told that, that's in a video that they have that's available. If you want more information, ask Jenna because she knows everything about Rafa House. Um, she's helping plan the event. So if you want to be a part of that, talk to Jenna. Um, this girl, they rescued her from slavery, but she ended up back in it. And you hear that story, and it's baffling. How does that happen? You go from this horrible life to freedom, and you end up back in it for whatever the reasons are. But then we look at our own lives, and we see we're free from sin, but we throw the shackles right back on. These kids don't get to choose. They don't get to choose when they get taken, when they get forced into slavery. They don't get that choice. You choose. You can choose to let Satan have his way with you, to own you, or you can not. You can choose to dedicate yourself to a pursuit of God and holiness and sanctification justification. You can grasp that hope that God gives you, or you cannot. You can choose to be a slave to your sin, but why? Christ has set you free. The price has been paid. I'm going to flip back through this whole chapter. There's some verses there that I want to stress to you. In verse 2, it says, we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Verse 6, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Verse 7, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Count yourselves dead to sin, says verse 11. Verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. 13, do not offer the parts of your body to sin. 14, sin shall not be your master. 18, you have been set free from sin. And verse 22 Now that you have been set free from sin, do you hear these verses? Do you believe that the Bible is truth? Because if if the Bible is truth, these are hard to get a hold of. Paul even says it's hard to get a hold of. He tells them, he puts it in human terms, because we are weak. Because we have limitations. My small group was talking about this last night. We mentioned something that um, Nathaniel talked about last week. It is inevitable that I'm going to sin, was the comment. And that's, that's our thought process, right? I'm going to sin. And we quote the verse, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that's, that's right. All have sinned. Not all will always continually keep sinning. It says all have sinned. And then we go back to that line of verses that I just reread from chapter 6. There is hope. Sin doesn't own you. You are not doomed to the same cycle of hate, the same cycle of mistakes, the same cycle of depression, the same cycle of being lost. You're not doomed to that. You are not a slave to your sin. Is sin inevitable? I mean, normally we would say yes, that's our go-to answer, right? But is sin inevitable? According to chapter 6 of Romans, if we're trusting the Bible to be the truth, it doesn't say that sin is inevitable. Is it going to happen? It's up to you. It's your choice. And, and I'd love to discuss this. I don't want to discuss this because it's tough to discuss. But I'd love to discuss this. So if you guys want to come talk with me, talk with Shandy, talk to Nathaniel, I just totally threw them under the bus with this. But come, come talk about this because I'm looking through Romans chapter 6 and it says we're free from sin. 
Jesus paid the price. There's a story in the Bible, another story. For everything, there's a story in the Bible. In John chapter 8, and I'm going to read that to you. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple. All the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to preach, to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that he might, they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, from now on, sin no more. Why would he tell her that? And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin, is one version. Go, and from now on, sin no more. This is, this is not what we think about, because it's easy to say, I'm a sinner. That's my identity. I'm a sinner. But Jesus saved me, so it's okay. Shall I go on sinning so grace may abound? That's, that's where we, we, we fudge the line and find our identity in our sinfulness, when really our identity is in Christ, and Christ has set us free from sin. What do we do? Well, the easy answer here, if we're looking through Romans chapter 6, is we go, and from now on, we sin no more. But if you're like me, you hear that, you look at that now, and you're like, what the crap? You are free. John 8, 36, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. So what do we do with that? We're bad decision makers. We make bad choices all the time. But the scriptures here tell us, and I, I think it's pretty clear, it says you're free from sin. You have sinned. Stop it. You don't have to do that anymore. Whatever it is in your life that's pulling you away from the holiness of God, get rid of it. You don't have to do that anymore. You can make the choice because you are free from sin. I'm repeating myself, but for a purpose. You are free from sin. Stop it. Jesus has paid the price. God came and found you, you lost little sheep. You're safe. Trust in that. Believe in that. Let God do his thing in your life. Go now and sin no more. If you haven't chosen Christ and you think that sounds pretty good, come talk to me. Talk to your friend. Talk to Shandy. Talk to Nathaniel. Talk to the person sitting next to you. Talk to someone because Christ has set you free and you are free indeed. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for what you've done in our lives. God, thank you for setting us free. God, right now I pray that that, that would soak in, God. I pray that we would know that we are free. I pray that we would embrace that, God, that we would take the gift that you give us, God, and that we would live like we believe it. Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us to look through your word, to examine the scriptures, and see what you say. God, help us to encourage one another and support one another. God, help us to turn away from the things in our life that aren't of you. I thank you for this group, this great cloud of witnesses, God, and I pray that we would encourage one another, that we would support one another, and that you would be with us, God. Thank you so much for your love, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.